I'm Georgia, I introduced earlier. I work here at New America uh, as part of the Open Technology Institute. Um, so for this second panel, I'm actually going to have everybody introduce themselves, mostly because I forgot to print out the bios, and that way they can be, uh, they can do themselves justice, and I won't mess it up. Um, so we'll just go through and start, have everybody introduce themselves, talk about uh, what you do, and um, maybe why you think we asked you to be a part of this panel. <laughs> uh, but the general idea for this, the framing question for this panel is to talk a lot more about the nuts and bolts of every day, getting a job uh, in tech, hiring people into tech who are um, from diverse backgrounds, uh, the policies that go into place with that, the systems and technology that's part of that process. So uh, does anyone want to go first? Should we start? We'll start. Mona, you want to go? Yeah. All right. Mona. Hi, everyone. My name is Mona um, Abdul Halim Kishor. And my background is sort of pretty unusual. I think actually a lot of women who end up in tech who have at least been in it for a while have come sort of through different turns. But mine started off as I was a scientist. I worked for a government contractor as a chemist. And then I ended up going to business school and I also got my master's in public policy. And while I was at Carnegie Mellon, um, which is also Georgia's alma mater for grad school, I ended up getting really interested into uh, social innovation. So at the time you get an opportunity to do a summer internship. I chose to do mine in Silicon Valley with a venture capitalist who was writing up a white paper on the reason why diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams in terms of um, investment ROI. And so that was a great experience and it sort of inspired me to then start my own company right out of grad school. And it was a social enterprise. We focused on developing technology to help job seekers get matched to the jobs that are best suited for them because there's a lot of very high tech algorithms on the employer side but not the job seeker side. And then ultimately that company about three year, years ago was sold and acquired by an organization that has different job boards for diversity candidates. So I think just because of all the different reasons um, I just mentioned, that's why I'm here and presently I work to manage a, the largest private label travel website, um, AmericanExpressTravel.com. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Mariella. Um, I recently graduated in 2012 from New York University. I was doing my major in politics. Um, soon after graduation, I got a job offer with the Department of Defense. So I first started off as an intern, then got promoted to administrative assistant, and then eventually um, became junior financial analyst for the Department of Defense. Um, and um, I have a hearing disability. And um, one of the things that I noticed was that we would have a lot of veterans that would just use really small hearing aids. And um, I ha used this service that's called CART. How many of you have been in a courtroom? Me? All right, I will not ask why you've been in a courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, essentially when you're in a courtroom, there's someone that's typing down everything that's being said. And so that technology is incredibly useful for people that have hearing disabilities because rather than hearing, we can actually read what's being said, ensuring that we don't miss anything in the conversation. So I used to request this service when I was in the government, and um, I noticed that it was a Ford building facility, but I was the only individual requesting accommodation. And I always noticed that it was always the same people, the same people that were kind of like sitting around me looking at the computer that was allowing me to read this conversation. And I was like, hmm, it's kind of like the same people. Are you guys following me around? I know I'm pretty, but come on. <laughs> and so um, I noticed that they all seemed to have some sort of hearing disability because they would just ask people to repeat themselves. Or I would just notice, like, you notice this thing. And I asked them, why are you not requesting accommodation? And it was always a combination of fear of discrimination as a person with a disability and that kind of pridefulness that many veterans have. And so um, I went up to the director for the disability office for um, the DOD and I told her, hey, I think you guys have a problem because you have all these veterans that are requesting accommodations and you have these reasonable accommodations that are not given to them. And she said to me that 
Um, three there. She said, I didn't have enough experience with disability. Never mind that I've been deaf for almost two decades. <laughs> she said that I didn't have any experience with communications. Never mind that I'm actually doing my master's in communications. And then she said that I wasn't in a long enough time in the government. And I'm a firm believer that you don't need to spend 20 or 30 or 40 years to know how something works. And so I was like, OK, well, um, that seems to be a problem. And so I found out about Code for Progress, which essentially is a program that teaches people how to create software and applications and website. And I was like, this is so awesome. I have a communications background, so I'll know how to create campaigns. And then I have this incredible passion in social activism. And then now I'll be able to create software. I'll be unstoppable. <laughs> and so um, I just finished, I'm about to finish the fellowship program at Code for Progress, and it's been an awesome experience. So that's why I'm here. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Tom Connor. I'm here from uh, The Motley Fool, right in Alexandria, uh, Virginia. And um, I've been there for a really, really long time. I'm dating myself, but it was the late 90s when I started there. And in that time, I've been uh, hiring, recruiting, um, doing a lot of kind of people development, uh, managing there. So I, so I should say I'm the vice president of uh, software development at The Motley Fool. And uh, the last uh, two years, we started thinking about kind of hiring a little differently uh, and started these uh, programs. We gave them a silly name. There's a lot of silly things at The Motley Fool. And so the programs were, were these uh, the spandex programs. Anybody remember spandex, the fabric? It's kind of stretchy. OK. Yeah, still around, right? Yeah. I remember. I think it's probably still in use. Yeah, OK. I might be wearing some now. No, uh, so, so um, we named the program. Uh, 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 the first year was Dev Smash. We were trying to hire developers. And the idea was to expand our, our ranks of developers. a terrible name. Anyway, uh, so we started the program. And uh, uh, I've now done it two years in a row. And the, the basic notion is that we're, we're trying to find the very best candidates that we can. So we bring in a bunch of people, and we actually just have them work with us for four or six months. And then towards the end of the program, well, we'll just kind of retain the very highest performers, actually. Um, and so we, we've done that a little while. And it's been really interesting in terms of diversity, the, the, the kind of hires that we've been able to find that way, more, you know, more so than, than normal conventional hiring, which is, which is great. Um, at the same time, we're also getting you know, fantastic hires, which is obviously a, a goal. So anyway, I've um, been there a while. I kind of consider myself, I guess, a curator if you will, of, of, of people and talent. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I, and then in, in terms of why I'm here, I'm just, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about the subject. And I think, was it you, Mona, that mentioned uh, that, that a, a diverse team is a so much higher performing team. And once you kind of get turned on to that, once you kind of recognize that, I'm trying to, I, I want our teams, we have about a dozen uh, tech teams at The Motley Fool, and I, I want them to be as high performing and moving as quickly as possible, of course. Um, and having done it for a while, you kind of notice, ah, the teams that are more diverse, whether it's racial diversity, gender diversity, any kind of diversity, introvert, extrovert, whatever it is, uh, those teams do better. And the teams where you have kind of a lot of people that think and act the same way, those teams don't, don't do as well. And once, you, once your eyes are kind of open to that, it's like, oh, wait, this is really important. This matters. And so uh, here I am. <laughs> I, I, my name is Brooke Hunter, and I am with Engine. And Engine uh, works to support technology entrepreneurship. And so we work with a lot of the startups that people were sort of talking about uh, on the last panel. And we also just launched a diversifying tech caucus on the Hill. Um, it's a bipartisan, bicameral caucus. And uh, we do think that there is like a role for policy in increasing diversity. Um, and I think that that is a lot of why I'm here, in addition to the fact that this has been just a lifelong uh, passion of mine as, um, as a woman growing up in the South and um, as someone who really, I, I'm very proud of the opportunity I got at my last job, which was at Public Knowledge, to really increase the diversity there and see what a difference that made in the kind of work that we could do. Um, I feel like we had a much stronger team uh, when we had a more diverse team. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very passionate about these issues, and I'm really happy to be here. So I think I, you, all talk, you all mentioned, uh, as part of what you do, and I think it's something we've been talking about today, about curating a diverse team. Uh, and there's lots of ways to do that. And I think I know one of the problems we have at, as like a nonprofit public policy institution is we don't always have money that we can spend on doing on curating that and so we have to we look at like how to work with um, other partnerships well but if uh, I wonder if all of you could talk a little bit about 
uh, that process and what you think works and doesn't work and what practices that have been working. So you talked a little bit about the dev smash. <laughs> that, yeah. um, but, and like Etsy has a similar thing. Uh, you know, Code for Progress is sort of a similar model, but an independent program. Um, what do you see of the things like that that are working? How are they working? Like, talk about more of the specifics of some of that. How did you curate a diverse team at Public Knowledge? Those sort of questions. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, one thing to actually point out that I'm glad Tom brought up is, you know, it's not always diversity how we normally think of it. And in my last company, as we were trying to identify how do people recruit more for, you know, a good match of skills and not looking too much into things that we shouldn't be looking at, such as race or gender or, or orientation, et cetera. And so through that process, I actually uh, developed a partnership with the MBTI Foundation. Um, they do a lot of work on you know different personality traits, how they work together. And I would say one of the biggest ways that I've noticed discovery Myers Briggs. Yes, sorry, Myers just, Briggs, sorry. <laughs> yeah, just so got it. so Myers Briggs is MBTI. Um, and so, you know, the theory is we all fall into 16 different buckets, but if you look at a lot of the studies that have been done around this, in general in the US we push people towards a single personality type. We give more um, merit, I should say, outwardly to people who tend to be extroverted, um, more big picture oriented, more social. And that may not be how people really are, but we're pushing them towards that. So one of the ways that I've seen people across a lot of different organizations really bring out diversity is to do some of these trainings that make people self-identify the different ways that they digest information and make decisions that are complementary to one, e one another instead of trying to conform. That's good. Um, I think the Vice President of Engineering at Etsy uh, also mentioned this is a, a separate notion than that one, but um, and that is um, just make sure that you're not lowering your standards necessarily. It's not something that you have to do to hire diverse teams. Um, for, for us, when I'm hiring, I'm, I'm kind of broadly looking at great communication skills and technology. Communications are very important since particularly in software, you're dealing with things that are not physical, right? There's no physical manifestation. Everything's kind of abstracted and then there's abstractions upon abstractions, right? So it turns out that being able to communicate is a, a very important thing. So we're looking for communication skills, you know, hard technical skills and, and soft skills, getting along with a team. These small teams we have are, you know, sometimes two or three people, sometimes five, seven people. It's important that you can kind of get along with that team and, and that people like working with you. Um, and so I think, uh, what was the guy's name at Etsy? I can't remember, but, but he, he has a great video. If you guys haven't seen it, check it out. Um, but, but he kind of talks about this, and I think we've seen the same thing as well, which is across those three different things, communications, hard skills, and soft skills, I think it's not okay to lower your standards. Like, oh, we want diverse candidates. We're going to lower our standards and just bring people in here. But I think it is okay in terms of hard skills to have a different, uh, a different bar there, right? So if you can find a diverse candidate who is you know, highly experienced and has great hard skills and soft skills and communicates well, that's fantastic. It's probably going to be difficult to find all three of those. And, and obviously, the, some of these numbers we talked about earlier in STEM was at 25 30% mm -hmm. diversity. And, and in, in tech, by the way, our, our uh, women in tech is 15%, I counted. Uh, so pretty low, but I think also on par with, with some of the rest of the tech industry. Um, it, if you want to get those numbers higher, consider you know, lowering what the requirement is for the hard skills, right? which I think some people are not OK doing that. They're like, no, we need somebody who really knows you know, eight years of coding or whatever, that's going to be difficult to find. So, so you know, stick to your guns, base guy. We want a, a great communicator, a verbal communicator. We want somebody who has great soft skills and can get along. And we're okay with the hard skills being a little bit lower, because you know what? That's something that you can address. And that's something that you can build up. And we've seen uh, that over the, the two programs we've run. We've brought in people with, you know, uh, lower skills, and we're, we're able to build that up pretty quickly. So I, I think that's another thing that works is, is yeah, yeah ha have a lower bar there. So I think for me, it's somewhat similar. It's about taking chances on people. Like one of the best hires, I'm just going to say this, that uh, I ever made was just someone who was really talented, uh, had not had 
a ton of traditional experience and he just blew that job out of the park. I mean, just, and has gone on to have a very successful career, which I, I honestly think that we were able to help him by giving him a platform to really prove himself in a way that other people just weren't really ready to take a, a risk. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I think some of it really is about knowing what you can teach people um, and knowing what you really need them to bring to the table. But it's also someone on the previous panel was talking about, who do you know? What, who, what are your networks? If your networks look just like you, that's a, that's a real problem. Um, and you need to be building more diverse networks. Um, and, I, and I think you can't expect to increase diversity if, you're, if you don't have diversity in your life. Um, and I think that's something that everyone should be making you know, if you look around and you do that assessment and you realize that everyone you know does look like you, then you need to really spend some time and do some work to cultivate relationships with people that don't look like you and have more challenging conversations and really like put that effort in. And I think that that should not be optional. I think that's my major sort of piece of advice is you've got to bake this into everything you're doing and especially you're working with startups that should be baked into the platform. You shouldn't have to wait for some venture capitalist to come along and say, how come you know, you're not diverse enough? That's how everyone needs to start. I think it's an interesting question. Um, it, I mean, the personality test piece, right? Uh, I think probably there's a lot of people who also like equally think Myers-Briggs is crap. Right? I think I'm very, like, there's people on all sides of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because it it's hard to, if you put people in a box, uh, so if we let people self-identify or if we talk about personality traits in that sense, you also then can end up with like uniform cultural environments, right? So not necessarily, again, not diversity in we, how we typically talk about it, but um, if we are looking for people who fit in personality-wise, you can end up with a pretty homogenous group that way, right? And that's not necessarily what you need either. I mean, it's the same thing of like the social, like we push people towards being a social communicator organizer type of person, but if that, then where does that leave room for people who are quieter, more introverted personality types, right? Or, or maybe who ha have, are hard of hearing, right? And I've just never, have always chosen to step back because they needed to. Like, how do we make space for that um, and for other options in that pathway? I don't know. If, I, how, what do you, I mean, in looking for jobs yourself, right? Do you, when you're applying to a job, are you looking for uh, do you aim more for like a community that you feel welcome in, um, a challenge that you are going for, for starting something new? Like how, how to make that choice? I think, Marilla, you're applying to jobs right now, right? <laughs> so like what are the things that you're looking for in the companies that you're um, thinking about working for? Uh, what type of environment are you aiming to find? I think it's an interesting question that we all might learn from too. I actually had an interview right before coming here, so I'm kind of wow. like <laughs> rushing <laughs> through the day. Yeah. Um, but one of the first things that I ask um, in my interview is, will I have support? Because um, there's so much, there's only so much that you can learn in a fellowship like Go for Progress. There's only so many hours you can put. And it takes time, it takes um, a level of comfort that you don't always get in every position. Like you need to have um, support. You need to be in an environment where you know you're going to be feel welcome. Because let's face it, um, if you've been to a conference in technology, there's usually like a room full of white guys. It's just the reality of it. And so um, when I go into those environments, I find somebody that has like a sticker for Code for Progress or Hear Me Code, and I'm like, hey, I know you, and we got to the same age, yeah, and that's really, really great to have that kind of like support group and not be in an environment where you really stick out like a sore thumb. So one of the first questions I ask, will I receive support in this organization? Will I have somebody that I'll be able to ask a question if there's a line of code that I don't understand? Just because it can be really overwhelming if you're just finishing a fellowship and then you go to a position where you are in a role of management and um, of, of an entire application, and it's just really, really scary. So that's one of the biggest concerns that I have as a fellow of the Code for Progress program. Just, is there going to be somebody that I could possibly like have a coffee with, ask about a line of code, so? Yeah, I think, and support takes a lot of forms, right? I mean, because there's an interesting question from the policy side of things, like how could we build more structural support 
like for startups generally? Are there like organizations we could be pulling together that can help some of those, those pieces? Um, you know, what what are the things that we could do from a more systemic perspective as well? Because that support might be at the organization, but if it's a small organization, they might not be able to do that. Like, where else can it come from? You know, but yeah, uh, well, I think there definitely can be, I, I think there's a need for policymakers to really understand all the dimensions of this problem. Um, and that is one of the things that we're hoping to address with the Diversifying Tech Caucus is just that they don't necessarily always have all the research they need at their fingertips. And that's one of the things that we would like to help them with. Um, and there was a lot of talk about sort of implicit bias, and I'm, I'm really glad that implicit bias has sort of entered the conversation as a term that we all sort of uh, can now hopefully take for granted that most people understand. Um, but I think that we need to make sure that everyone's aware that, that we're all operating with that every day. And that when we're developing policies, we're developing policies that, uh, that also reflect that implicit bias. And so a lot of it is, is just about educating uh, policymakers and making sure that they are aware of all the dimensions of the problem. Um, I mean, there are just so many different policy possibilities. Um, you know, I was really happy that Obama made, uh, you know, working policies to support working families part of his State of the Union. Um, I think those are things that a lot of, like, work environments, uh, they don't account for the needs of families, even though all work environments are made up of people, you know, who have families, so. Well, that's an interesting point because um, I now work remote for my organization and I've been reading up a lot about organizations that do allow telecommunication and working remotely and it's funny because I would say now if I were to join a new organization, even if I didn't necessarily want to be remote, I would question them and make sure that they have support for people who do want to be remote because you know there's a lot of advantages and that's another way that I've seen a lot of companies try and diversify if they're you know headquartered in an area where it is more difficult to get diverse talent. Um, my startup was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for the first few years before we moved it over to Chicago and we had to confront that reality and we had people who ended up working in Boston and the Bay Area because we couldn't necessarily find the diversity of talent we wanted in just that one area. Yeah, there's, um, we actually, when I started at OTI, I was remote in New York um, and we only had a handful of people in our New York office and I, when I started, a lot of people warned me that it was gonna be really hard because the, the way DC institutions work, um, all of public policy institutions work, like people just walk around to each other's desks and they're not, like no one's using chat, <laughs> right? Um, we, and so one of the big things was getting everybody actually using chat rooms, like being okay, sending an email to find out if you were available to talk uh, before calling the person or showing up at their desk or, and we use video chats constantly. Because um, we still, now we have people in Miami and Philly uh, and we still have people in New York and um, actually New America now has someone in California again. So we, we like, we're trying to figure out how to make it work, but it's, it's actually, it's hard because people in the central space have to be really conscious about it too. I don't know if, anyway. Yeah. Maybe think I'm Marissa Mayer at Yahoo. I wonder what you would have to say <laughs> about the remote work. Yeah, did did he used to be remote and get called? No, in he's. Uh, I mean, their strategy has been quite opposite. Yeah. They realize that they want to build out a culture. So, in exchange for eliminating their teleworking policy, they're now infusing more benefits to those people who are willing to stay. Um, just because, I mean, that's a whole different strategy. It's something we struggle with at Motley Fool as well. We, we are increasingly international. We have presence in, in five or so countries at this point, and so it's difficult. And I think it's one of the things where, honestly, I think we're on the wrong side of history if we think that we have to have everybody in the same location, whether it's for culture or for you know faster, you know, accelerated business practices or whatever it is. That's you're going to lose that battle eventually. Um, I have to, I hate to admit it, but I'm I'm still in that train of thought where I'm like, no, no, people have got to be here, you know, because that's the culture is here and the community, and it's all true. The level of collaboration is much higher. I still believe that you know you're adding some fraction of value when you're not 
at the, the mothership, at the home base. Uh, but again, over time, that's going to be wrong thinking, you know. So, so I'm the guy like, you know, yes, it's, <laughs> it's the, it's the horse is the way to travel, folks. You know, like, yeah, okay, great. You know, it, you're going to lose that argument. And eventually, there's going to be a much more distributed workforce. And we just have to figure it out, whether it's Skype. And we're trying things, you know. But, I, yeah, to, to me, it's still, <laughs> you're still way better off. You know, part, so. of it, part of that's because one of the only ways you can have a real conversation and address the unconscious biases that are in the team already is by talking face to face, right? We haven't, virtual communication hasn't gotten there yet. Right, absolutely. I, I love that notion that, that there are different bandwidths of communication. So face to face communication is the, is the largest, highest bandwidth communication form there is. You know, and then you get smaller and smaller as you get to video. And it, you know, like I said, the bottom is, I don't know, text messaging or something, right? Wait, what did you tell me? You know, <laughs> is that what you meant? No, no, I wasn't trying to say that. Didn't you see the smiley face, right? So that's a very, you know, a very narrow bandwidth of, of communication. But yeah, it's a difficult problem, I think. The, 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 te the teleworking thing, but it, it's coming. <laughs> yeah, it can be. I think it's interesting as both like a potential solution because you're not limiting yourself to the people who live in an area, so you're not you can actually expand past what is already an existing sort of diversity issue in any given city. Um, or, uh, but you then have to figure out how to handle the cultural uh, bridging and making sure that you're actually still supporting people who wouldn't be in the same room, that sort of thing. Um, Okay, so let's actually talk about resumes for a little bit. Cause I, so Tom touched a bit on the idea of not necessarily lowering your standards, but also potentially lowering the bar. And I think that I'm, I'm going to guess that what you mean is addressing sort of what Anne-Marie mentioned on the first panel about um, not looking at standard credentials, like not necessarily requiring that people come through a computer science program, but like making space for programs like Code for Progress to and hear me code and having people show that they know how to do stuff um, but might still need support. Uh, where do we think that is right now? Like how, I, how you know, what are you seeing in applying for jobs um, from your experience with resumes? Like some credentials actually can hurt you. Uh, some, some can help you, but maybe they help you in the wrong way. There's like biases built into that. Like do we think people are actually ready to walk away from credentials and sort of support these other programs, other pathways. What do you guys think? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think from a technology standpoint, certain things on your resume definitely can hurt because the majority of employers out there use these applicant tracking systems that match and score your resume against a job description. And it's, it's mostly keyword matching but now it's becoming a bit more sophisticated and it's using semantic technology but a lot of times especially if you're an entry-level candidate or someone who's applying to an industry for the first time you have a lot of you know background that's not necessarily in the space you're stepping into and then you're more likely to score pretty low against the job in those systems but that's why I think people need to be more cognizant of how those systems operate and essentially think of your resume as a web page, something that you want to search engine optimize and pick and choose your experiences. You don't need to talk about your time being a camp counselor, you know, if you don't think it's directly relevant because having that information that's not directly relevant can actually hinder your score instead of you know, bolster it. Yeah, I think that's right. I, honestly, for me, a resume is not a, a, a super important thing. I don't care a lot about the school that you attended. Um, certifications, at least in the software side of things, are a little bit of an anti-pattern for me. When I see a lot of Microsoft certifications, I kind of go, ooh, it's a little bit of a, sorry, no offense to Microsoft, but uh, <laughs> I think that's not true on the engineering, the server side. The, the guys that I work with are much, they want to see the Cisco certified or whatever. So, um, but for, for me, I think the, the resume is a pretty quick kind of just glance. Does this person have, are they even in the right ballpark? Because you will get people who apply who are like, you know, 12 years of experience in the restaurant and food services industry. And you're like, that's great. But, you know, it's, you don't have any experience in any technical area whatsoever. So kind of weeding those people out. We, we, at the Molly Fool pretty quickly, and we did this in, in both of the programs, we pretty, pretty quickly go to a coding test right away. So right away we have a little project that you need to code up on your own time. 
And uh, it's usually something pretty basic. I think we had like a little weather application where there was like an API that you would have to make use of and you know, type in a zip code and show the weather in that area, something like that. And so I, I guess I'm much more interested in what you can do. And I want to see that and I want to see that you prove that to us than I am what's, what's on the resume and particularly certifications. All right. Um, so uh, for a few months now, I've been looking for a job, and um, I've kind of like worked around with my resume, and I feel that um, technology is like making coffee, and, or trying to be a barista. Is you, but people like Starbucks, they want to hire somebody that has experience, but the problem is that if you're applying for a job as a barista, you need to know how to make coffee, but you can get a job because you don't have experience. And it's like a circle that repeats itself. You can get a job because you don't have experience. You can get experience because you can't get a job. And it's just a circle and a circle and a circle. And so um, for the last two, three months, I've been applying for jobs because I'm trying to get experience. And I keep telling people, well, I have all these skills, I have communications, I know how to diffuse situations, I know how to create buying power, I know how to put together a team, I know how to manage a project. And Employers tell me, you're a great candidate, but we want somebody with a lot more experience. And that prevents me from getting the experience that I need to be able to get to an actual full-time position. And so I'm constantly looking for apprenticeship positions or fellowship positions so that I can get that experience. The problem is that a lot of those fellowship and apprenticeship positions are actually full-time management positions like costumed as apprenticeship. They expect you to like, create the next Facebook with just the bare minimum skills that you have. And so it's really important to be able to create these pipelines that we are constantly talking about that will allow people to get the experience they need to be able to get in those management roles that will allow people to feel comfortable in creating really good code. But, but I think the great thing about technology is that you can kind of dive in, do you know what I mean? So with, with the Starbucks example, yes, you need access to the $6,000 Italian barista machine, you know, like, you know, how are we going to get one of those? With technology, you can kind of do it, you know? So I, I, again, if, if in terms of experience, like, go build something, you know, it's, it's, it's almost free, right? You can go find some website and code up something in Ruby or Python or whatever it is and show, show something, you know, and, and get experience that way. I'm not saying, <laughs> I, I, I know you're probably doing that as well, but it just, that, that's something that, and then again, on a resume, you can put that like, oh yeah, I built this website and it does this little thing, whatever that might be. And then if you do have some coding tests or something, you know, you're able to kind of dive in pretty, pretty rapidly. But yeah, the good news is there's nothing really holding you back, right, at least in technology. I mean, that's actually the reason why, you know, I decided to, to go in right after grad school to, to start a company because I figured going into the job market, I wouldn't be able to get the technology management jobs that I wanted because I didn't yet have that exposure. But I think that's where startups have a lot more openness to people without traditional backgrounds. And I think they are generally, you know, more willing to take that risk that I know Brooke mentioned earlier. And can I just comment on yeah. this this one? Uh, so it's a it's I'll just it's a pet peeve of mine that this country and a lot of businesses and nonprofits in this country uh, really benefit from a huge source of unpaid labor, and that is interns and fellows uh, who are not paid. Um, and I think that a lot of the experience that you're talking about you could be getting at a paid internship or a paid fellowship. And I think that this is something where, again, I really, I feel like the tide is turning, but I wanna just push it a little more and say, this is really important. And if we're talking about like not taking chances on non-traditional applicants, the internship is a great way to develop new talents, to grow people's skills, to see what they can do. It's an internship or it's a fellowship. It's something that has a set time. And it's a way that you can, A, identify future talent, uh, that you can grow future talent, and maybe you can say this person isn't, you know, isn't at this point the right person for our organization in the long run. But at least you know, you've gotten to know them and gotten to know their skills, and you've helped them develop skills that will be useful to them. But you can't do that if they can't afford, particularly in a city like Washington, D.C., it is so hard to live here uh, and to find a sublet for the summer 
if you're not being paid anything, it's presuming a level of privilege that I think we all need to acknowledge, and I think we need to just start paying our interns. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. We pay our interns, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, that, that needs to happen. It's, it's, and, and interns are a great way to, to find candidates. I definitely want to draw on that um, because I've been incredibly lucky that I have a family that's incredibly supportive. And so um, as I'm struggling to try to find a position within technology, my family has been incredibly supportive, um, helping me with like money for the rent, money for food, um, trying to keep me busy. However, um, for somebody else, somebody that has a job, somebody that designs their own website or something of that sort, for them to do an uh, internship or fellowship, even if it's paid, it's you're asking for an incredibly big sacrifice, and a lot of people see that as a huge barrier to even get to an internship. So that's something that I really want to bring attention to. I also think it's just, I mean, Alia brought this up on the first panel, um, sort of how we ask people, what we ask in interviews about trying to figure out if someone's the right candidate. Like I think, you know, um, Marilee keeps talking about communication skills, and communication skills are crucial. Like Tom, you were mentioning it as well. And how, who and how you're good at communicating with and what you're good at communicating are, I think it's something we don't always get at very well in interviews. Uh, like you, you know, one of the first, you were saying like you get to a coding test quickly, but how do we assess how people are good at communicating? Like just from, can they work the interview? Or like what are good, what are good ways that we could start to understand how people would be good team members? Um, well, well, yeah, I mean, in, in my mind, the short answer is there is no good way to do it in a three or four hour period. It's impossible. And that's why I think you have to bring people on into some kind of uh, program. And, and again, we, we run a couple of them. I know their companies have, have as well. I think it's Hungry Academy, right, at Living Social and so forth. These kind of, these kind of programs where y you're, you're not going to know. Really, you're kind of rolling the dice. The analogy I love the best is, is it, it, it's kind of like going out on a date or somebody with somebody for one night and, and having dinner and be like, we should, we should get married. It's like, whoa, you know, that's, that's, that's a pretty big commitment just based on one day worth of interviews. And frankly, I, I would challenge everybody, go, go run some metrics on your interview pr process, or, or rather, what, what did you think of people at the interview day, and then how did they actually turn out later, let's just say, I don't know, on a one to 10 scale, whatever it is, you know, and see how well you're doing. And I, and I, I think you'll find, when I looked at that, it's a little bit like rolling the dice. You're, you're maybe marginally better than just random, you know? So <laughs> you might as well just have, you know, random people, monkeys, whatever, like, you know, like, oh yeah, hire this person, hire that person, you know? So anyway, I, I, I yeah, yeah, it might work better, <laughs> so. Might, what if we randomly place people at jobs? <laughs> exactly. Like if we just, just said, you know what, try there. Right, so communication <laughs> skills, all these kinds of things, and also people put on an interview face, an interview persona. I don't know if you guys have had the experience I have of, of hiring somebody, you're like, wow, this person's really energetic and talkative. No, that was the interview day person. When, once you hire them, they don't make a sound anymore, you know, whatever it might be. So anyway, I would just challenge everyone, like, to figure out a way to bring people on, try them out. Obviously, let them know up front, you know, this, this is a trial program, and, and we're not going to necessarily keep everybody at the end of this, but, um, you know, I think that's the only way to find out, is, is uh, back to the dating analogy, maybe you have to <laughs> yeah. be with somebody a little while before you marry them, you know. <laughs> well, <clears throat> especially in a team setting, a lot of times you need the wrong candidate to know how to target the right candidate. Because I've had that horrendous experience where, you know, someone came in, they just seemed perfect for the role and then we brought them in and we realized it was the worst fit possible and they realized it too and thankfully it was just an internship so they left and went to another organization but then it made us realize our job description was completely off we weren't targeting the right candidates so then when we finally did target correctly it was it was like magic well, so I think a lot of that can be addressed based on how transparent you are about your own culture, right? Because I, nobody wants to land in the wrong job and nobody wants to hire the wrong person for, for the job. Um, and I feel like a lot of that is, again, on the employer to really show, like, you know, for instance, do you have a lot of support for people? Is there gonna be somebody who's gonna be able to go get coffee or answer your question on code? Like, some places that's just, the answer to that question is no. And they owe it to you to tell you that in the interview process. And I feel like in the job description, you get a real opportunity to talk about this is the culture of this organization. And then 
I mean, obviously, it's also on the candidates to interview the place that they're being interviewed by to see, you know, who is it that gets, um, you know, how do people act in the interview? Do they seem all distracted? Are they, you know, are they all on their phones the whole interview time? And what does that tell me about the culture? Um, but yeah, I, I think employers can do a lot more to be transparent and to say, like, you know, you know, like Netflix does a good job of this in their like hiring deck. If you haven't looked at it, it's really interesting. Um, but you know, they say like if you need support, you're not going to get it here. Really, I mean, I, I <laughs> hope I'm not totally mischaracterizing <laughs> that. It's not quite that like black and white, but it's similar. It's like we, you know, we need people who are really self motivated that don't need a lot of guidance at this point, you know? And, and I think that that's really important. And then I, as a candidate, could look at that environment and say, I, well, I think I could work there or I don't. So um, Jordan is holding up the five minute thing. Uh, so I'm going to see if, does anyone have questions they want to ask? Is that a question from the, okay, cool. <laughs> hey, so my name's Bruce Arthur. I'm with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a federal agency here in DC. Um, we've had a lot of success when we're hiring developers, transitioning from resume review to portfolio review, where we ask them to send samples of their code and then we analyze it. And it really lets us hire people who would probably never make it through a resume stage because their code comes from like their hobbies or things like that. On the other side, when I do that, I am taking a developer who's off a project that they're passionate about and telling them to devote a week of their time to reviewing code samples, 90% of which will be bad. And there's a client for that project who will also be upset that they are temporarily losing a developer, even if there's obviously a payoff down the road. You know, how can I help build institutional support for this superior way of evaluating candidates that takes a lot more investment on the front end? Can I repeat the question? Yeah, so, um uh, he was saying at uh, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, they have switched from resume review to portfolio review. So they're actually having people review code um, as part of the application process. But that means that he has to use a lot of resources internally to review that code. So how to, how to manage that trade-off is basically his question. Uh, two things come to mind. First, uh, it's important to have everybody on board with the notion that, that people are probably the most important resource your company has. I, I know that's true for us. I don't know if that's true for every company. I don't know if you know, a company with a lot of patents or maybe Coca-Cola has their secret formula. Maybe that's the most important thing. But I think for a lot of organizations, people are, are A, perhaps your largest expense. Again, they, it is for us in terms of comp and benefits. And B, probably the, the largest opportunity lever that you have in the organization, right? In terms of, hey, if we were somehow able to make everybody a super performer, what's the upside that that would have? It's probably the most massive change in, 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 in good for your organization possible. Anyway, so that's one notion is like get people on board with like hiring is really, really important. And, and I, I do need your time to help me look through this stuff, th th through these code samples. But then the second thing is a week long, that sounds like a little heavy duty. I would consider something a little bit lighter. So we did a thing where we had like a Google spreadsheet or something and we had the candidates and their submissions, the URL for their submissions or something and people would just kind of drop in notes and they didn't have to go through everybody. Maybe they just look at one or two peoples and so forth. And since it's in a spreadsheet, you can kind of see like, well, nobody's looked at this candidate's submission, so I'll look at that one. And, and so, you know, I, a week feels like a long time. I, I, would, I would suggest it's a couple hours spread across multiple uh, different uh, developers on the team. But, but yeah, you do need their time and they need to be, you know, on board with why it's uh, important that they, that they look at those submissions. Yeah, I, was, I, um, I read a really interesting article this weekend that was, like the title was, The Way We Hire Is All Wrong. It was on Medium, I don't know if people saw it. But um, the premise was this company in Silicon Valley has started running, um, rather than hackathons to have people like work and build tools for them, they're actually doing like hiring hackathons where they get people together for a weekend or two and have them pitch projects and work together and see how they sort of work in teams and filter each other out. And then you have work and projects from that weekend to look at. And it was just like a really, for me, it was a really interesting thing to think about how, I mean, we have trouble sometimes even just like getting the jobs that we have out to networks to get applicants. Because <laughs> um, there aren't, it's hard to explain to people sometimes what developers at a think tank do. Um, and we work on some like kind of crazy projects. but. 
so sometimes we just don't get applicants, but could we do an event instead and actually sort of get at that like resource question quickly, you know, spend a day. I mean, there's a lot of prep to an event. Like an event does not just take one day. I think we all know that. But um, it just sort of begs the question for me, could we change how we are spending our time to do the recruiting process at all and make it more like a short version of a program like what you guys have or a short version of a Code for Progress or Code for Progress Hack Night, which we should also probably just come to more often. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing that makes a developer more nervous than a whiteboard. Seriously, like uh, every time I go on a whiteboard, like every time I go on an interview and they basically tell me, oh, I want you to write the code on the board and I have to write the code on the, uh, the code on the board and then I have seven people looking at me that makes me sweat bullets. Like my brain just like, danger, danger, run away. <laughs> it's very nervous. And so I think a better strategy would be, hey, this is what we're working on. This is what we want the website to look at because a lot of coding really is about Googling stuff. Like really, it's point black about Googling stuff. I actually taught my roommates how to code yesterday. Yeah, the day before yesterday, I was teaching them how to do HTML. And um, they were like, that's it? Like, that's all it is? And I'm like, yeah. And then eventually, they just went to Google to like look at how to add images to the HTML. And that, I was, they were just like, that's so easy. And all you have to do is Google stuff. And so I think a better strategy for these interviews, rather than um, if it's divisible by three, I wanted to write buzz. And if it's divisible by five, biz. And Isabel. then if it's divisible <laughs> by three or five, biz buzz. Your like, when are you ever going to write an application that actually does that? So how about giving me uh, an assignment for something that you actually want to create. For example, you want the image to scroll up and the text to scroll down, or you want this button to hover, or you want this to happen, because that's what I'll actually be doing when, if I get this job. And so I think that those type of interview strategies would be better than asking me to do some really stupid code <laughs> that where I will have seven or eight people just like stressing me out, and I probably will not be able to like think properly. And I think that actually changing that to Something else that's actually more effective and applicable to the job would be way better. Um, Jordan, yeah, go for it. There's our, yeah. Jordan, you want to? Okay. Either one. We'll get to both of you, I promise. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Keisha Lee. I'm really interested in strategies for transitioning into an area um, that's technology focused. Um, for those of us who are not coders or programmers or developers, um, but um, are probably also a little bit more advanced and further along the get an internship feel so that you can gain experience. Um, she was asking about uh, for people who have, are more later in their career transitioning, so an internship doesn't necessarily feel like the right path, but they want to learn more, like learning to code or learning just to be in work in technology more, like what are good strategies? Um, and options in that space. So not just, because an internship, if you've already, a lot of people, if you've had a job for a while, the idea of like going back to an internship is sort of hard to emotionally like work through, right? <laughs> um, I think probably all of us can talk to that experience at some point. But yeah, if I, I, does anyone want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, so I think the first thing that you have to do is really identify what transferable skills you have, um, because I do think uh, there is a lot more to tech than just coding. Um, and so I, I think that there are possibilities out there. I would probably just spend some time looking at websites of companies that you think you would like to work for and seeing the kinds of job descriptions they have and seeing how you could fit your skills to those jobs, if there is room to match and if there are discrepancies where those discrepancies are. Um, I would also say that you know because we are in DC and it is, you know, super networking town. There's so many opportunities to go out and meet people working in tech. There are meetups, I feel like, five times a day. And so uh, another thing to do is just to go in to talk to people and to see you know, what path they took um, and get their advice. And then you're also putting yourself on their radar. So if they have a job open up later, they'll say, oh, there was that person that I met that seemed like she might be a fit. So that's probably where I would start. 
Yeah, and to add to that, I mean, I remember when I first wanted to get more involved in, you know, web technology and not the lab technology that I was in, I did the same thing, just looking at my network on LinkedIn, who had jobs that sounded really interesting and what were the steps that they took. But I think if you're at an organization that has anything to do with technology, which I think almost every organization does, the best way to do it is to go speak to the people in your company who can vouch for your work ethic um, and give you a chance to do more within the organization you're in. Um, I really welcome you to come to our Hag Nights for Covert Progress. It's every Thursday from 6 till 9. Um, we cover a whole range of topics. Um, two weeks ago, we did how to do data analysis on the voter registration. And last week, we did HTML and CSS. There's an entire support group of women and um, uh, people of color. We're just an incredibly welcoming environment. So I really encourage you to come to those Hag Nights. Um, in addition to that, if you are kind of intimidated by the Code Academy and kind of like those websites, because honestly, I find them incredibly boring. They're useful, but not, they don't have like that little flavor that like gets you excited. <laughs> um, so at Code for Progress, we really try to like cut down the coding bro grammar language and really kind of like sink it down to like the way I'm speaking, like in normal English. So we kind of like take these really difficult concepts and talk to them in like real life language. So if you're interested in learning how to code or talking to people about how they're using technology for whatever career you want to switch to, Thursday, 6 to 9, you can like come to me after this and I'll give you all the information you need. And just to add to that, I, I think we're talking about coding a lot in technology, it, it, and somebody mentioned it's not necessarily the same thing. So I guess the thing I would suggest if you want to get more into technology is try to try to figure out what you're really passionate about, what what's what you're the most in, into, because that's going to obviously be the best area for you to go. So you know, broadly speaking, there's kind of hardware, networking, you know, that kind of side of things, and and it's if, if you're interested in that, try building a PC. It's not hard. There's all kind of things online. Try that out. Dabble with it. Like, oh, this is really cool. I'm into this. Okay. Maybe you know heading into technical you know engineering uh, you know server networking that kind of stuff is for you, or maybe it's design. Um, you know that's another obvious area of technology. Yes, there's software and coding is another area, and then there's data. So you know I'm just you know these are high level areas, but figure out which of those is the most interesting to you and dabble with it a little bit. And you're like, dude, I love data. This is amazing. There's this table, and I'm going to figure out you know what what's the highest incident of of some piece of data in there. I'm going to pull I'm going to pull that out. You know that's exciting. You know if if that's exciting to you, maybe you should head you know, into, into databases and, 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 and SQL and so forth. So yeah, figure out where your love is, I guess is what I'm saying first. It's funny, as you were saying that, I was my I answer that sort of in a slightly different type of figure out what you're interested in. Um, one of the patterns that, they've, that people have found in research around uh, women in STEM fields is that if the problems you're working on aren't social impact problems, um, women tend to walk away. So just because it's like, why am I doing this? I don't know the why of the data. So I would also recommend thinking about problems in the world you want to solve and then finding the organizations that are working on those and figuring out what they need. Like talk to people about, if I wanted to make an impact in, on your project tomorrow because I care about that project, like what should I learn how to do? Uh, and focus your energies there. Because that'll probably lead you down to the like, we really need help with data or we really need help with design work. Um, and frequently it's design work I will just I'll put that out there. A lot of projects need design work um, and would love input on it. So, but focusing on the problems that you're interested in solving is the way that I would recommend starting. Um, and then, yeah, Jordan, there's the next question. Hey, um, I'm Rachel. I'm a software developer at Sunlight Foundation. And um, I have, I, I'm a software developer. I've pretty frequently been the only woman in a room. I have also been the only woman at a company. and. Um, it feels like a second full-time job sometimes when you're like the one who's like, we don't have a sexual harassment policy yet. We need a sexual harassment policy. Hey, guess what? We still don't have a sexual harassment policy. We really need a sexual harassment policy. Hey, I know you guys have kids, but none of you has ever thought about potentially being the like primary caretaker of a child. Like, what are we gonna do if I wanna do that? I mean, I guess my question, and basically at this point, I don't think I would work at a company that was all men ever again. And I can only imagine, I mean, I can only imagine how much worse that would be if I wasn't also white. Um, so 
I mean, that, that just cuts down the amount of jobs I'm willing to apply for and the ability to sort of, for those, for companies who are start off as three dudes to, to increase their appeal and diversity as well. And I, it just feels like a stuck problem to me. Like, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on, I, both of you guys said, I think you were, in, you were involved in startups mm -hmm. stuff. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Well, it's funny because with my startup, I was the one person HR. And I personally wanted to take that role for that reason. Um, in the start, I was the only female we had. I was on the business side, not the tech side of things. So um, I made it a passion to make the environment conducive to bring on female uh, employees and developers. And then uh, soon after, once we put in our health care policy in place, uh, we actually did then get our first lead female software developer who actually uh, Georgia knows very well, <laughs> coincidentally. <laughs> but I do agree. I think, um, you know, being out in Silicon Valley, I sp I've spent a lot of time out there. And it is difficult if you're a female developer because you don't want to have to be the one to say, well, you know, we need to think about these things. You want it to be brought up, even if it is just a completely male-dominated organization. And I think just culturally, some of those things are naturally shifting because men are being more concer concerned about paternity leave and things like that. Um, it's not just becoming a women's issue. But I do think it, it, it is going to take time. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you do have to make sure the organization has that representation to think about those issues. And to be honest, you know, I myself probably would not jump in an organization if it was, you know, 10 dudes and I was going to be the only woman um, unless I wanted to bring forward those issues. Yeah, was one, of the, um, one of the other Code for Progress fellows, his name is uh, Kathy Ortiz, who's um, in New York and figuring out what she wants to do in, in New York, uh, said to me that she's asking a lot of the startups that she's interviewing with, like, why should I be your one female developer? So sort of putting the question back at, at them, but saying, like, make it worth my time <laughs> to be your one woman. <laughs> because cause it is. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of work. I mean, I think we, um, it's funny, within our own team here at, at OTI, we have a heavier male tech team that's, you know, we now have a few women who are on it. There's, I'm not on the tech team, but I write code every day. Um, and we talk about it a lot, but all of us do emotional support for everyone. It's sort of more the culture of our office um, in a way that maybe we all need to do like less of that in general. <laughs> I think it's something that happens when you work in social causes too, right? If you're working on uh, socially focused problems, everyone's doing it because they're passionate about those problems. And so you end up, um, everybody ends up helping each other in that way. So it can be a supportive culture, even if it is male dominated, but it also, there's, you know, there was the Office Housework article in the New York Times a week or two ago, and a few of us have been sending it around the office and figuring out how we can use it like a intervention buzzword in our meetings. Be like, you know what? Office Housework, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna let you guys handle that one this time. You can reserve the room, make sure that the meeting happens, do an agenda, and like hand that off more. Because it's, it's those little tasks that sometimes still end up on the people who are willing to be the like, caretakers in the office, too. But I, those aren't always just women, I will say. There are a lot of men who take on those roles, too. <laughs> I think w one solution, obviously, is as an organization becomes larger and there are women in the HR group and so forth, these problems kind of work themselves out. But it, 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 it takes a surprisingly long time. And uh, I guess I've been surprised, and um, there's a woman I work with who was telling me that uh, we're, we're over 300 people now, but not too long ago, she had to ask for the mommy room. You guys know about mm -hmm. the mommy room? So, <laughs> you know, and so it, the flip side though, I just have to say is, is so anyway, it, it, it can take, you know, organizations in 150, 200 people before people figure these things out. But the flip side is, literally just from my standpoint as a, as a white dude, I didn't know what that was. I did, I mean, I'm like, I was 35 years old. I was like, what, why, is, why do we need to have a room? I don't know, and then slowly, you know, I was like, oh, 
you know, only after I had kids did I understand, like, oh, the young mothers with the babies have to go. Okay, I got it, you know. And so, anyway, so I, I mean, it's a weird thing to bring up, but I would also just promote, like, just, let's just, can we just talk frankly about this? Look, we need to have a private room where women can go with young babies with their equipment, you know, and to take care of, got it, okay. <laughs> so, the mommy room, you know. Anyway, yeah, these things should just be open, we brought in the open as much as possible as well. I'm not saying that's easy when you're the only female at a 10-dude company, but, uh, you know, frank discussion would help, <laughs> I feel like, too. Any other questions? Uh, anybody else have questions for each other? Okay. Um, all right, well, I uh, thank you, everyone, for participating today. I, like, it's, I Hopefully it was interesting to have the two panels, um, but uh, I really enjoyed it, and I'm really glad to have had everyone here and hope everyone had a good time. Um, so thank you for coming and for helping us push the conversation. <laughs>